Hello, everybody. This is Parshas Mitzora. Sometimes Tazria and Mitzora are combined. This year they are separate since we had two Adars. And it is also pretty much Erev Pesach. Pesach is around the corner on uh, Monday evening. And so you might think that I'm crazy for doing this tonight, which I probably am. And I was definitely debating uh, back and forth whether to uh, do this year or not. I want to keep up my record. Um, but also, I, I I thought pretty much it would be understandable um, if I if I couldn't make it this week. Um, and then I had a few minutes today, and I didn't really have a set. Sometimes I know the parsha of the week. I know exactly the message I want to bring out that week. Um, you know, I think of it every year, year to year. I think of the same message and the same uh, lesson that sticks out to me. This one I, I I didn't, especially because usually it's, you know, Tezria Mitzora. And so the Tezria message I, I shared last week. And um, but I had a few minutes today and I'm like, okay, let me let me open up the safer, the safer that I've shown you before that I use. Um this is Shulchan Shabbos. It condenses Sichos of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. Um, I find very poignantly, very beautifully. And um, it has a beautiful index in the beginning. <clears throat> so I and it summarizes each of the Sicha summaries. So this has happened to me a few times this year since I started this year, um, which also coincides with October 7th. And, um, and, and this is one of those times where I opened it up and the very first Sicha, the very first uh, lesson that it talks about, because again, there, there are many in, in each Parsha, and the very first one for Parshas Metzora is titled Yehudi Mechapes Hamid Es Hanes. I will translate that. A Jew. What does a Jew do? What, what is a Jew? Who is a Jew? Somebody who searches. What does a Jew do? Somebody who he searches, he or she searches always, Tamid always for the, for the nace, for the miracle. And immediately I was like, that's it. I got to do it. Pesach or not. We have to be here. Why? The Jewish people just experienced a biblical level miracle. Biblical, biblical level miracle. This past Motzei Shabbos. Um, and it was bugging me that there wasn't more hurrah about it. There wasn't more talk about it. There wasn't more excitement. And the chats weren't blowing up with, oh my gosh, we just experienced like Kriyas Yamsov. And, um, you know, uh, you know, what do we do? What do we, what do we, how do we express our gratitude to Hashem? What do we, I was a little surprised and I, I didn't know what to, you know, where, where, what, what was my part to, to do? So I shared on the groups, if you're coming from my Faith Over Fear WhatsApp group, I definitely shared there some thoughts and um, also later in the week, um, I took the opportunity to write something up a little bit, but mainly it was just like this weirdness for me of, hello, we just experienced this wonderful miracle. And so I'm excited. I'm so excited to have this opportunity to discuss with you straight from this week's Parsha, straight from a Sicha on this week's Parsha, the lesson that um, of the eyes that we need to have and the perception that we need to have in, um, in our life in general, and then how much more so when we have such a miracle. Um, and if in case somebody is um, watching this in a future year, I'll just spell out what the miracle was. We had um, um, the very first... Um, unprecedented Iranian attack, direct Iranian attack on Eretz Yisrael and um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. I've seen 350, but I've also seen a count of 400. So between 300 and 400 um, aerial attacks. So missiles, attack drones, um, and other kinds of things that I are, um, I'm not sure what they're all called, which we saw also some of them that let's say one that dropped into the Dead Sea, how massive it was. Um, so each one, right, was with the intent to, to kill, with the intent to destroy. 
with the intent to harm. Um, and yet, crisis averted. We're okay. Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel is okay. The Jewish people are okay. 99% success rate of intercepting these, these missiles and drones, etc. That is unheard of. Unheard of the 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 people in charge of creating the systems for intercepting such attacks would never expect they themselves tell us they would never expect such a high success rate the um the engineers the I, i'll just give you some background here um This past um, year, a few months ago, I was had the privilege of listening to, I think his name was Aaron uh, Sacher. Uh, I think Aaron, Aaron Sacher, one of the creators of the Iron Dome. And he came to my community here in Philadelphia and he gave this theatrical, humorous, witty, incredible speech. And his point was this. His point was, and he is a creator of the Iron Dome, right? And his point was, you want to see a miracle? You want to know what a miracle is? Look at the Iron Dome. Look at the creation of the Iron Dome. Dome. The implementation of the technology. He also described how quickly it was it was invented, which surpassed everyone's expectations. The success of it way surpassed everyone's expectations to the point that instead of firing two intercepting rockets each time, they only had to do one because they saw that the first one was usually a success. So why waste another $100,000 on a second one each time? He he explained to us that this is a miracle and I'm gonna get into it a little bit more. And what he brought in was where do we see, where do we learn in Judaism, the idea that a miracle can either happen in an outright direct way, such as Pesach, Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, the 10 plagues, Kriyat Yamsuf, or it can happen in 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 a in a way that encloses itself into nature. Nature. I'm gonna. I might use the word teva. Nature, meaning the miracle is hidden behind a facade, where we can blame the um, technology. We can blame the expertise and the you know, science and say that was the success when truly who was calling the shots, who was making it happen was God himself. So where do we see that? Not by Pesach. Pesach has open miracles, but rather by Purim. So I was speculating, and why? Why Purim? The whole story of Purim, we, we say al -hanisim. We say al Hanisim on Purim, thanking God for the miracles of Purim, and yet the miracle of Purim was considered a hidden miracle. Not one time is God's name written in the Megillah, uh, in Megillah's Esther. Not once. There's no point in the entire Megillah where you could say, oh, that's an open miracle that defied nature. But rather, God embedded into the natural occurrence of events, the natural events and the politics and the craziness of Vashti and, uh, you know, refusing to come and being killed. And then Esther of all people in the entire um, empire being chosen to be queen and, 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 and Mordechai overhearing Big Son and Sarish. Da, 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 da. There's no point where you can be like, oh, that's an open miracle. But rather, God embedded his, um, embedded himself, really, 
into the natural course of things. And he created the miracle of, of Purim to take place in a way where you could just say, oh, well, it just, you know, amazing, <laughs> amazing turn of events, <laughs> amazing coincidences. And as we know, that is Amalek. And Haman is a direct descendant of, of Amalek. And so the idea of, of, of Purim is anti-Amalek. Amalek was the one who brings doubt to the Jewish people. The one who says everything is by chance. al They happened upon you on the way. They chanced upon you on the way. Karcha is from the word um, kar. They cooled us off. They cooled off our excitement from the Yetzias Mitzrayim, from Kriyas Yamsuf, from the exodus of Egypt, the 10 plagues and the splitting of the sea. The Jewish people were on fire on fire and and just wow inspired and so believing of God and then Amali comes and fights us and they said nah not a big deal nah Kriyas Yamsuf the ten plagues no they're all they were all natural occurrences they weren't real miracles there's there's nothing to be afraid of and they cooled off our excitement and they also cooled off the excitement of the world because at the time the entire world had a fear for the, of the Jewish people like whoa, I heard about that Kriyas Yamsov thing. That was weird, right? Or as we know, the Midrash says that the water split everywhere. But then only a Amalek had the, the audacity to come and cool us off and cool off the excitement and inspiration and the, the emuna, the belief of the whole world at the time. So, and what karcha also means, it comes from the word mikre, which means a happenstance, a chance occurrence. A Malik believes in coincidence. A Malik believes in, in chance, in, in randomness, right? Why do you think um, Haman did a, a, a go rally, a lottery, right? He, he believes in randomness, chance, yeah. And yet the Jewish people, our, our core belief is that there's no such thing as a coincidence. We need, we need fight off the Haman. We fight off the Amalek inside of us, the doubt inside of us. And we say there is no such thing as a coincidence. In fact, the word mikra, mem kuf reish hey, a chance occurrence. If you turn around those words, it says rak me Hashem. It is only from Hashem. That's the Jewish perspective. And Megillah's Esther, the word Esther, right, means to be hidden because Hashem's name is hidden. And Hashem's name is hidden because the miracle was hidden. The miracle was hidden behind nature. So what's our job? Our job is to legalot. The word Megillah is the same root word as legalot to reveal the Esther. Megillah's Esther means to reveal the hidden. It's our job as Jewish people, our, our God-given divine mission in this world, purpose in this world, to look at the world and instead of a mikra, to see rakme Hashem. Instead of teva, nature, to see, to megillot the Esther, to megillah the Esther, to reveal the hidden and to recognize the Hashem behind everything, to recognize the miracle in everything, the Hashem in everything, God's hand in everything. So as I was, it happen, happens to be, <laughs> it does not happen to be, by incredible divine orchestration, I taught I had the privilege of teaching Megillah Esther this year to uh, to high school girls in Delaware. And as I was teaching them these ideas of, of seeing God behind things and, and, and seeing how God is protecting us through Teva, through nature, that's his method of protecting us for now, as long as we are in Gullus, Gullus being a state of exile, not only that we don't have the base of Mikdash, but we don't have God's revelation in the world. 
right? That's what the, that is by definition, what Gullus is, is that we can't see God, God's reality. It, he hides it from us. That's what Gullus is. And therefore, because he is in a state of hiding himself, but he still wants to protect the Jewish people. So what does he do? He, cre he hides himself through natural means, through technology, through the incredible, um, unbelievable intelligence of the IDF, through the incredible, unbelievable uh, technological advancement of, of Israel, as we know, for a startup nation, right? That's no coincidence. That's no coincidence. That is God embedding his miracles into the very fabric of Israel. The, the strength and the um, brilliance of the IDF is God's way of protecting us. So as I was teaching this, I thought a lot about the Iron Dome. And I wanted to show my students how you want to see how God protects us in a state of, of godless, in a state of exile, even when um, um, when he, he, he doesn't come out and, and do it in an in a overt way, but he hides himself in technology. Just look at the Iron Dome. Just look at this magical, miraculous technology. If you think about it for two minutes, you're like, are you serious? That exists? The technology and the, 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 the existence of the Iron Dome itself is unbelievable. And then you look at its success rate. Again, only after teaching this and thinking about it, I then heard Ari um, Sacher describe how, how the statistics, statistics really don't add up. And it's, 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 you want to see a miracle, see how it's, how it works. See how, how it works, how it really works. Majority of the time. And I went up to him afterwards and I said, you know, I've been thinking, of, I've been teaching Megillus Esther and I've been thinking a lot about the Iron Dome. And he was so thrilled to hear that. He's like, ah, oh, you got it, you got it. So take that to this past Mote Shabbos. And these aren't rockets from Gaza anymore. This isn't just our Hezbollah. This is not just simply an Iron Dome working its magic. This is the greatest threat to the land of Israel that probably we have ever seen directly attacking us with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, again, missiles, attack drones, etc. And 99% success rate. Uh, and an Israeli, um, an Israeli Arab girl was severely injured and she's fighting for her life and we wish her um, health and life um, and, a, and a, a recovery. And there was some damage, a, a small amount of damage on an air base. And other than that, like, I, we went to sleep, right? Saying to Hillim, wondering what will become of our family? What will become of the land of Israel? What will we wake up to? But because, you know, like how they say, like, like no news is good news, but we have to say that because we're so, um, the way that, I, it's so crazy, but the way that our brain works is that when there's good news, it's like, my husband and I discuss this sometimes that, you know, there are the things that are annoying in life. Like if you're not feeling well, if you have a stomach ache for a few days, like what is wrong with this stomach ache? What is going on with me? Like, I gotta get this checked out. What's the, pro you know, what is it? Where's it coming from? And then it disappears and you don't even notice. You have an issue in your house. It bugs you. You're trying to figure out like, what do I, what do I do with it? It, it disappears. You didn't even notice. We don't notice. The way that God designed our brains 
is that we don't necessarily notice when things are going right, when things are good. Or in this case, because we woke up to good news, it was like, okay, I had cold toe moving on. No, stop thinking about it for a second. Dance, sing, praise Hashem. Imagine yourself on the other side of Kriyat Yamsuf. I've heard from multiple people that, you know, I've heard Manus Friedman said this was a biblical level um, um, miracle. And I've heard others say this was um, a scientist who also looked at the statistics and said, this, this is Pashit a miracle. He said, this is a miracle on the level of Kriya Syamsef. And I want to tell you something. At the times of Kriya Syamsef, the splitting of the Red Sea, there were people who said that it was the wind. So it all depends on your perception. You want to be an Amalek? You want to be a doubter? Go right ahead and miss all the miracles. But a Jew? A Jew believes. A Jew believes, and a Jew believes that everything that happens is directly from Hashem, and that as much as we're grateful to the IDF, and as much as we're grateful to our allies and the unity of the response that occurred that night, we recognize where it came from. There's a Pasuk in the Torah, Yevarechecha Hashem Elokecha, in Devarim, uh, this is Devarim uh, 1429, if you want to look it up. Yevarechecha Hashem Elokecha Bechol Maase Yodcha Asher Taase. Yevarechecha Hashem, Hashem will bless you. Yevarechecha Hashem Elokecha. Hashem, your God will bless you. Meaning, just stop there for a second, all our success, every bit of our success is directly from Hashem. It's directly God's bracha. But how does he choose to do it? In all the work of your hands, asher ta'ase, that you do. So yeah. If we would have, you know, said, okay, God will protect us and, and, you know, put our, you know, and put our feet up and, you know, God's going to protect us very nice. I can just, you know, let, let, uh, let him do his thing. Well, that's not how God wants us to do things, which is why I, back to McGill Esther, I can get into a whole sheer about this and I didn't even get to the Parsha yet, but that's why Esther ultimately after fasting, for three days, she went to Ahasuerus because God wants us to use our political protexia. He wants us to use our technology. He wants us to show up and do our part and not just rely. We're not, right? We're not meant to rely on miracles, but there is a very big caveat. We're meant to recognize where the success is coming from. My entire... Um, Torah, you know, elementary school, Torah education. I remember hearing over and over and over again in Chumash and Navi, this idea of, of, of um, people in our Tanakh making the mistake of kochi v'otsem yadi. Kochi, my power and my v'otsem and my strength is in my hands. Biblical figures who made the mistake of seeing their own success and their own strength as theirs. And you want to tie this into Pesach? That's Paro. Paro is the ego. Paro says in um, Yefeskel, I believe, he says, the, the, river is, the river is mine and I created myself. The Nilos, right? Everything, the success of, of Egypt, which was rooted in the Nile River, is mine. It's because of me. And I created myself, right? It's the ultimate, like, I am ev everything, right? Revolves around me and I am everything. And it sounds extreme, but we all have this to an extent when we don't recognize where our success comes from. And so in a global national sense, yes, thank God for the ADF, but that's the point. Thank God for the ADF or the ADF needs to thank God. The success that we saw is from Hashem. And even when it's not so outright, even when it's not so miraculous, our success is from Hashem. And I've been noticing it the whole year with the, the, um, the 
it's hard to say because obviously every single soldier soldier that falls is is devastating to the entire Jewish people. But the the fact that we've only seen two hundred and sixty, again, not to minimize that whatsoever. But if you just simply look at statistics and what was expected and the kind of fighting that we did and are doing in Gaza and in Judea and Samaria and in the north, and you see what's happening. Shoots, I'm running out of time. I have 10 more minutes and I didn't even do the uh, Mitzorah at all. But if you see, it, it's, it's miracles. It's miracles. Daily, daily we're seeing miracles and the soldiers are coming back and seeing that. So if that's true, first of all, of any success you have, you study for a test and you do well, it's from Hashem. You, you, you beat the odds and, and, and something doesn't statistically add up, Kalvachomer, you need to recognize the miracle they're in. But something as large and as blatant and as obvious as Saturday night's events, it's our duty to, to see it for what it is. So <laughs> now that I only have 10 minutes to go through Mitzora, how does this tie into the Parsha? I think my intention was to learn the Parsha and then discuss in whatever time I had, but I, I couldn't help myself, so forgive me. Um, so this week's Parsha, we have the uh, we start. We begun speaking about began speaking about it last week um, in Tazria. The the Mitzora, the person who gets um, saraas, which again is is mistranslated as leprosy. It's a spiritual ailment, ailment, not a physical ailment. And first of all, the Rambam discusses about about saras. He says straight up, it is al tidi. It is above nature. It is not. And he was a doctor, right? He was a physician. It, it was not, it was completely not at all a physical ailment whatsoever. Obviously, it had its physical expression on a person's body or clothing or vessels or house. But it was, he calls it an os upella, a, a miracle and a wonderment. Haya b'Yisrael, k'day has hiran melashon hara, that we had in the Jewish people to warn us from speaking Lashon Hara, right? We know the connection Saras comes when a person sp speaks Lashon Hara badly about another person. And so, but he calls it an Os Upella, a miracle. And um, and the thing about this, right, though it would, it would happen in steps, right? First, it would go on a person's, the walls of their house. If they didn't get the message, if they didn't wake up and do Teshuva, then it would... Um, their house would have to be destroyed and they'd start to see it on on the vessels. And if they still didn't wake up and under, you know, get the message to stop saying Lashon Hara, then it would appear on their clothing. And at that point, if it didn't, then it would appear on their skin to, you know, um, and at that point, once it appeared on their skin, then they'd have to be separated, you know, outside the camp, go outside um, um, the camps of the Jewish people, be separated. It would be publicized. It'd be very shaming and nobody could talk to him. It was a very uh, difficult event. So there was this, um, these stages, right? And the thing is, is that it is the way that it, that it came about, right? It was clearly, um, clearly, this, if a person had their eyes open, this recognition that this manifestation of how it first appeared here and then here and then here, the way that it happened in stages, it became obvious that this phenomenon was not a normal, natural thing. And they recognized that it was Tsaras and the Kohen would identify, or actually the Chacham would identify it as Tsaras and the Kohen would call it Tsaras. Um, it was very obviously a, um, a, a, a not normal phenomenon. And he would be convinced that it was a sign from Shemayim, and it was direct Hashem's direct hashkacha pratis, Hashem's direct um, involvement in his life, in this person's life, with a with a special particular kavana intention that he should was should be warned from speaking lashon hara. 
So that's the idea of how a Jew was supposed to see what happened. Oh, this is weird. First it happened here, then it happened here, then it happened here. I better get the message. I better realize that this isn't just, you know, some mold on the wall um, or or um, a skin disease, but this is from Hashem directly to me. Hashem is trying to tell me something. And yet, Afal came. Me shalo wrote I I wish I had time to read this all to you so clearly. A person who didn't want to believe because it was tsaraas, which again could be mistaken. You could you could misinterpret it for just a skin ailment or on the wall. Okay, mold some mold grew right. If you didn't want to believe. You could claim that it was Teva, that it was nature, and you can search for a, a natural explanation, any sort of natural explanation to explain this phenomenon. It reminds me of Manus Friedman, who said this week, um, who said this week, do you, you know, if you didn't see it as a miracle, you didn't want to. If you didn't see it, you didn't want to see it. It was that obvious. So if you didn't want to see it, okay, you could explain it in another way. Um... Because at the end of the day, you know, the Tzara'as, it wasn't like a draw-dropping miracle, right? It wasn't, it was hidden in the realm of nature. And the manifestation was, was again, enclosed um, in this levush, in this enclosement of a disease, right? And a person which left the possibility for a person to insist on the claim that there was no kind of spiritual nature to it. And this, my friends, kan balide bitoi hahevdel. This expresses the difference between the hashkafa of the of a Jew, between and and the hashkafa, the outlook, the perception of um of a Gentile. The Jewish people are called ma'aminim b'nei ma'aminim. And when a Jew encounters something, anything, he immediately sees the hand of Hashem in it. And again, that should be true with every little thing that happens in our life. We should see Hashem's hand in it, even when it's not a miracle. But especially when it's a little bit, you know, out of out of whack, obviously we should see it as Hashem's hand. And kalvachomer, kalvachomer, an outright miracle. So this, again, kal masha olam, everything that happens, even nature, we should see this way. But um, Roe Yehudi Esmetis, this is how we perceive the world. This is how we need to perceive the world, that everything is coming from Hashem. And this differs from, again, the perception of um, non Jewish nations, the Gentile world, where Afilu Misha Makir Sabori, even somebody who believes in God, what's his outlook? That the outlook of a Gentile, he searches. Four explanations in Teva. He searches for explanations in logic. Even when he sees a nace, and the timing of this Sicha for this week is unbelievable, right? It says even when he sees a miracle, and he said it's a miracle, he'll still try to figure out a way to say that it was Beteva, that it was some logic to it, some explanation to it, some nature to it. So the non-Jewish way of looking at let's say the events of Motei Shabbos, are to say, oh, well, this is how you could explain what happened and try to, you know, bring out exactly what, oh, it's because, you know, we were all united together and we had this technology and we had, you know, try to explain it away, right? Or you have, um, I've seen news anchors where they can't explain it away. So they said, oh, it was meant to foil because they don't want to believe in the miracle that they're seeing themselves. It was meant to foil? No, 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 no. We're talking about Iran against Israel here. It was meant to destruct. And the Jewish perspective is exactly the opposite. Even when we see Teva, we need to see a miracle. The Baal Shem Tov said, I heard recently that the only difference between Teva and a nace, miracle and a nature, is, is, how, is frequency. How often it occurs. A Jew looks at the sun rising each morning and says, a miracle. I'm awake, a miracle. A baby born? How do you see that as a miracle? It makes, it, it's unbelievable. So a believer will see an open miracle in nature, in Teva, in regular occurrences, while a non-believer will call an open miracle 
nature explain it away. We have to see and be grateful for the miracles that we just experienced. Have a kosher and freelich in Pesach and a good Shabbos.